Good evening. Jonathan Shepard arrived in Pennsylvania in the fall of 1962. He got a job working for Hall of Famer Burley Cox. <clears throat> he liked what he saw, but the family business was calling and he returned to England. But before he went home, he bought a little Volkswagen to tour the country. After he returned from his tour, <clears throat> he loaned his car to me. Jonathan has always been practical. Some would say cheap <laughs> when it came to his cars. There was a big problem with the Volkswagen. The accelerator did not work. You had to raise the hood, then set the accelerator manually before you got in the car. The engine then ran at a constant high speed, which made driving, particularly parallel parking, a uniquely interesting experience. <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> when Jonathan came back from England, he rode jumpers with some success, but realized that training held more promise. He embarked on his career with a modest group of steeplechasers, but quickly more and more people noticed that his horses were running better and winning more than they should have been. His innovative training skills, training methods, and caregiving skills led to success after success in both codes, steeplechasing and flat racing. And that success has been mind numbing. He has trained the winners of 14 Eclipse Awards, almost 90 million in purse money, and thousands of races. Fascinated with breeding and bloodlines, he has bred here in Pennsylvania literally generations of horses who have triumphed as stakes winners as both flat horses and steeplechasers. But as important as his success as a trainer have been, what is equally important is the impact he has had on others. Jonathan has, Jonathan has been a Hall of Famer for years. He has mentored or supported dozens of horsemen, including the following. Janet Elliott, who's here tonight, Jerry Fishback, and Julie Crone, all of whom would end up in Racing's Hall of Fame. Other luminaries would include Graham Motion and Barkley Tagg, whose success speaks for itself. Jonathan's achievements are incredible, yet he remains unspoiled, driven, and based on the fields full of young horses he has, that he has bred and will train, there remains much more to achieve. Jonathan, you're a great man. Well, this is quite a surprise, but a nice surprise. I'm sure there's many people just as deserving as me of this honor. I've been fortunate to have been given some very nice horses to train. And I think we do the best we can with what we've got. That's always been my motto. I didn't really set out to achieve goals and records. I set out to try to do the best I can with each horse under my care. I'd like to thank Patty for that nice introduction. 
if they had a Hall of Fame for timber riders, he would probably be the first one in it. And I'd like to thank my other guest tonight, Janet Elliott, who was very instrumental, as Patty was, in my first early years of training. She was my assistant for seven or eight years, went out on her own, had a lot of success, and is now in the Hall of Fame. We have a little joke between the two of us. After she was inducted a couple of years later, I suddenly realized that she and I were actually the only two living members training members of the Trainers Steeplechase Hall of Fame. So I asked her one day, I said, Janet, I've got a trivia question for you. How many members of the living members of the Steeplechase Hall of Fame? And I said, I have no idea. I said, there's two, it's you and me. <laughs> So sometimes when we bump into each other, Janet will say, got a trivia question for you, Jonathan. <laughs> anyway, she's, she's done awfully well, and I'm proud of her. And I, I'd like to mention my parents, who were very instrumental in my being where I am today. Um, when I was very young, I grew up in the, during World War II, and a lot of restrictions, and my parents fox hunted, but there was no fox hunting during the war, and I was like three or four years old, and they had these couple of hunters down in a stable at the end of the driveway and sometimes they used to seem to enjoy putting me up on the back of one of them and leading me up and down the driveway and be perfectly truthful I was quite scared. These were pretty big horses and I was like four years old and they were pretty frisky because they weren't really being exercised and it looked a long way to the ground. But when I was I think maybe on my sixth birthday they bought me a little Shetland pony. He was nine hands three inches high that was more my size. <laughs> I felt much more comfortable and uh, I used to fall off him a lot but I realized you could fall off without getting killed and it wasn't such a bad thing after all. So those are the people I particularly want to thank um, along with some people that have been very instrumental in my career specifically George Strawbridge who gave me the opportunity to train quality horses that most people don't get that opportunity. So I don't think it's especially what I've done, it's the horses I've been given. And my longtime friend and partner, Bill Pape, who's been great, supported me all the years. We've had a lot of success together and a lot of fun. And when I first got into breeding, I had a friend who was a young veterinarian just getting started to, to practice in New York. And he and I were chatting one evening and he said he was thinking about trying to get involved in ownership a little bit. And he said, what do you think is the best way to go about it? Breeding or maybe just buying yearlings? And I said, well, I I'm, think I'm getting ready to try to breed a little bit and maybe get a mare or two. And he said, well, that sounds good, but he said, I don't really have a farm, so I think maybe I'll try to buy a yearling or two. And we said, well, let's see how we do in our different ways and, and we'll check things out in maybe five or six years time and see how we're doing. I started off on a pretty low scale with a pretty small budget and had a few wins but nothing great and he went to the yearling sales and bought a couple of yearlings and one of them was cost him seventeen thousand dollars he was by bold reasoning and two years later he won the triple crown his name was Seattle Slew <laughs> so I think he kind of got the best of that deal <laughs> um, I would particularly like to mention uh, the the honor that I've been given by the Pennsylvania breeders very much appreciated and I'd also like to congratulate them on the great job they do managing and administrating the, the, the uh, our breeders association and all the money that goes with it um, they, they do a great job I think it's the best actually the best breeders uh, program in the country and I'm proud to be part of it and I thank you all very much. <laughs>